I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled, How to Build a Professional E-Learning Portfolio. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you register through UCI Division of Continuing Education's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about our e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our winter quarter, which begins in January. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Tom Kuhlman, Chief Learning Architect at Articulate. And throughout his presentation today, we will have opportunities to answer your questions. But finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we may not have had time to address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat message over to John from UCI Support, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Tom regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel. So if you look at the top of the participant list on the right-hand side of the screen, you should see a row of icons. Go ahead and press on that chat bubble icon, and the chat panel will show up if, you, if it doesn't already appear for you. Again, please be sure to send your questions via the chat panel and select all panelists, and that'll ensure that both Tom and myself receive your questions. And Tom has uh, broken up his presentation into three different sections, so we'll have opportunities at the end of each section um, for you to submit your questions. We just ask that you do please submit questions that are on the topic that he has presented on. And again, I'll leave you with my contact info at the end if you have follow-up questions after the webinar is over, and I can go ahead and forward those on as well. Here's a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment, and more. As a student in the program, you will get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in online learning community forums, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is di designed for a number of audiences, individuals who are completely new to e-learning instructional design, training managers and coordinators, HR professionals, and individuals who have taken on a training role within their department. If you currently deliver face-to-face instructor-led training, your company may be asking you to switch to e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students should be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate program is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed Declaration of Candidacy form. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I, I usually advise students to take a few classes in our program before they declare, just to make sure they want to complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our program consists of six online courses. The required courses are listed below. We have Principles of E-Learning Instructional um, design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the e-learning instructional design practicum. Each course is 2.5 units and will run for eight weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the principal's course and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next. So taking the courses in this sequence is beneficial. Please note that there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must successfully complete all other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. 
In the upcoming winter 2018 quarter, we are offering the principles course, exploring e-learning development tools, project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the practicum. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $635. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student services office at the number provided. We encourage students to enroll early as classes do fill up quickly. Each course in the program costs $635, so you're looking at a total of $3,810 in course fees for these six online classes. Now you don't pay the entire total up front, you would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, you're looking at just under $4,000 for the entire certificate program. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Prior to enrollment in the practicum, students must purchase or otherwise have access to and gain working knowledge of an authoring tool, such as Articulate Studio, Storyline, Adobe Captivate, or other. Therefore, software may be an additional expense. Here's a screenshot of the certificate page on our website. There's a lot of information about our program requirements and course offerings on this page, so I do encourage you to visit it. And I'd like to specifically point out um, information about a special discount that I've circled here in red. We offer 10% off course fees to members of ATD San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles chapters. So if you are a member of any of these chapters, please visit the chapter website for more information about the discount. Here's a screenshot of our online course schedule, which has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any of the available courses by clicking the green online button. To be scheduled indicates that when a particular course is scheduled to be offered, but registration just hasn't opened up yet. And as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you will want to plan ahead. All right, at this time, it is my pleasure to hand, go ahead and hand over to Tom so that he can provide an introduction and begin his portion of the presentation. All, All right, right Tom, are you there? I am here. Thank Perfect. You. All right, well, I'm Tom Coleman. Uh, some of you may know me. I have the Rapid eLearning blog. I write kind of weekly eLearning tips and tricks and then uh, work for Articulate, so uh, um, I know the e-learning industry <laughs> well. Um, I've got some contact info, info there, so if you have any questions um, afterwards, you know, feel free to contact me, and uh, we've got a lot of you know links and stuff. And in fact, there's a PDF that'll be attached in the email that you get afterwards, and there's some links to portfolios and other resources, uh, so you can check those things out. And then, uh, like uh, was said earlier, we're going to do this in kind of three three parts. So let me actually move through my slides here. So the uh, first part, um, what I wanted to do in, in terms of the uh, portfolio is look at uh, three kind of main points. So the first part is, you know, what's what's the personal value uh, for a portfolio, right? That has nothing to do with, you know any of the public stuff, but what can you, why should you maintain one for you, for personal reasons? And then we'll look at like the professional uh, part of that, uh, which is especially important in this day and age because of all the uh, technology and, and, uh, and how people, you know, network and connect with each other. And then, you know, speaking of technology, we'll look at, okay, if I'm going to build a portfolio, you know, what types of technologies uh, should I look at uh, to do that? So uh, what we'll do is we'll kind of go through these three segments, and then I'll take a break after each one, and we can you know answer some questions around uh, those different uh, sections. So let's do this here. So probably the first question is, you know, what is a portfolio? Um, I think I think in a simple sense, it's it's kind of like your resume, right? You know, you know, 
I know years ago, some of you may be younger, but you know, years ago, uh, doing a resume was a real hassle, right? You had to type it up, and hopefully you didn't make any mistakes typing it up. And then you took it to a typesetter and picked out paper and and all that stuff. And then you went through this process of um, you know sending that out or taking it to places you were interested in working. And um, and in a sense, you know, the, your portfolio is kind of a way to kind of manage a digital resume, right? So it's a way to, to show your skills, uh, the experience that you have, and your qualifications. And I think it's um, so much more important today because uh, a lot of times, you know, people are more interested in seeing what you've been able to do uh, versus seeing uh, what you said you've done, you know, on paper in a resume. So a portfolio is kind of that visual representation of of what your skills are and, and what you're able to do, and and the e-learning world is is mostly visual medium. So uh, being able to actually show your work is is really important. So I think you know if you think about that, it's like you know how how do you document and show your skills and experience and and, and quantify that in in a, in a visual way. And so the portfolio is a way to do that. The uh, question. Um, we get a lot, you know, I do a lot of workshops and, and the, this topic of portfolios is, is always one of the most frequent questions we get. So, you know, the, the question is, you know, why why should I maintain it? And this kind of goes to uh, those three things we'll look at. I, said, I think the first one is, you know, it's a way to document what you learn. Um, it kind of puts you, I think, in like a personal development track. So if you use your portfolio, that way, it's a great way to uh, to, to uh, structure some personal learning and then and then document uh, what you're doing. And then you know eventually you can roll that into something you may want to show publicly. Uh, you, obviously, it's a way to showcase your skills. Uh, so it's it's nice to say here's an interaction I built versus uh, let me tell you about this project I worked on and not actually have anything tangible to show. So it's it's a, it's, a, it's kind of your museum in a sense. So it's a way for you to show your skills. And then I think an important thing, especially in this world today with the way we network, it's really a great way to create that first impression of who you are. One of the nice things about um, uh, the, the digital world today, right, is that uh, you can control a lot of that, whether that's good or bad, right, the, or whether it's even true. So, you know, depending on how people see you, you know, they, they make assumptions about what they see. And so if you're not as experienced but you have a really good uh, portfolio, uh, you could create the impression that you might have more experience than you have, which may create more opportunities without without being fraudulent. But, you know, the portfolio is kind of that first peek at, at who you are, so it's a great way uh, to control that first impression. The uh, probably the most common objectives we get um, when people talk about portfolios, and I'll share, you know, like when I've hired people in the past, uh, one of the things that I look at is um, I want to see their portfolios, the work they've done. I'm more interested in that than looking at their resumes. Because the resumes are great, you know, and typically organizations use resumes as a way to kind of filter people out of the process rather than filter them in. Um, but then when you get through the interview process and everything, it's, uh, eventually you're going to get to the point where it's like, well, let me see what you're able to do. You know, I want, I want some proof uh, that, that the resume and your experiences and things you say really match up to what you're able to do. Um, so what's interesting is a lot of times when I've hired people and I ask for a portfolio, you know, typically people will say they don't have one. Uh, and so what happens is, you know, I'll, you have time to go build one then after, after that. But um, if you're if there's a job opening and you know as you get higher up in in your skill level, then uh, there's it's a lot more competitive than basic entry level work. And when there are job openings, the people who have the portfolios, the people who are prepared, tend, you know, they're going to get looked at fast. And if you get the right candidate, you're going to, you know, the job's filled, right? So the person looking for an employer, somebody to, to fill a, a job, um, they're not going to wait around for somebody to build a portfolio. So I think it's important to have one. But, you know, when we talk to people, 
about, you know, why don't you have one? You know, these, these are kind of the three main things is one is I don't have the time. Um, and that, you know, that's true for all of us. I know as much as I talk to people about having portfolios, I can't say that I've um, built out my own portfolio over the last few years, you know, that I have all this stuff documented. Um, although I do have the rapid e-learning blog and kind of have some artifacts in a sense to, to show what I do, but, you know, I don't, necessarily do what I'm preaching um, but you know the thing is you have to make time right uh, can you afford to not have one I know there have been plenty of times you know in the training industry uh, generally training when the economy is bad and companies need to make cuts um, if you've been in training for a while you know this is mostly true is the training group is usually one of the first groups that's get that gets scaled back you know, fortunately e-learning kind of been protected by that because it's usually one of the things the organizations do to kind of uh, manage their costs so they do go to e-learning. But, you know, as, as e-learning becomes more and more prevalent, you know, that risk is there too. But, you know, what I've seen over the years is as people get um, uh, cut from the organization, what happens is they don't have access to their projects anymore. And uh, so they can't build a portfolio after the fact. And um, even if they could, they usually don't have the e-learning tools and those things either because those were all owned by uh, the organization that just let them go. So I think having that portfolio is important. Um, so it's really kind of a matter of you know prioritizing that and making that part of your time and, and kind of setting a schedule, which we'll, we'll look at. So it's kind of something that you could manage. Uh, the other question is, you know, I'm not sure what to do. You know, where do, where do I start with this? How do I put a portfolio together? What should be in the portfolio? And so those are some of the things we'll look at. And then uh, probably the bigger one, and sometimes I think this is an excuse people have more so than uh, being completely true, but it's like, well, I can't show you what I've done because I don't own it. It's proprietary. It's locked behind, uh, you know, closed doors or whatever. And, then, you know, that's true in organizations, right? There's a lot of content that you can't make public. Um, but I think a lot of times that's used as a cop-out, at least in my experience as hiring people or going through that hiring process. Um, and I think if that is true for you, then you've got to figure out, you know, how do you document what you know and what you're able to do without compromising that then. And so I think there's ways to, you know, take what you've done and maybe build ghost courses in a sense, build the structure of the course, but take all the content out so you're not giving away any proprietary content or find other ways uh, to show your skills. So if you if you built a drag and drop interaction in the proprietary course, rebuild that drag and drop interaction using uh, some generic content. There's all sorts of generic content, like the, a lot of government sites, they have like the uh, emergency preparedness training or CPR, or OSHA, those types of things. There's a lot of content that's available out there to kind of create, uh, to replicate what you might be doing in a proprietary nature and, and create those in kind of a new context. Uh, but I think it's important to have a portfolio, so kind of overcoming some of these objectives. So, you know, the time, it's really just about figuring out, you know, how much of a priority is and then figuring out how to manage that. And then we'll look at simple ways to start the process and then obviously, you know, the proprietary stuff, we just kind of covered that. So let's look at some of the personal reasons why you should maintain a portfolio. Um, I think the main thing is to document your learning. You know, a lot of people journal, you know, they, as they learn things, they journal, or when they're reflecting and thinking about things, they journal. In a sense, a portfolio could become that. So it's a way to document what you're learning. And, and because e-learning is mostly, you know, it's digital and it's mostly visual medium, uh, it's an easy thing to document. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, things that we've worked with interns and things that I've recommended to them is, you know, get an e-learning book or a book on training. Uh, or, you know, instructional design, you know, read the book and then uh, create a blog in your portfolio. It doesn't have to be anything that you're going to make public, but then read the book, read a chapter, or highlight a few key points, and then write a, a summary of these key points or what did you learn, or take something that you learned and then apply it to like a little mini module or something like that. Um, to participate in conversations with people, you know, one of the things I've seen people do is they'll take some of the blog posts, like for example, since I do the rapid e-learning blog, they'll read some of the, the content there and then they'll, 
you know, write reflections on what they read in a, uh, on an e-learning blog or training blog and then kind of write their own thoughts on that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, take some classes, take ongoing classes. What's kind of neat about the this, like the certificate program is the cost isn't really significant, right? So, you know, a lot of times people will ask, well, how do I even get into e-learning? I'll say, well, go to, you know, these the, a lot of these universities offer certificate programs. And I think that's a better way to start versus, you know, going to a, a bachelor's or master's program where you're gonna it's gonna take a lot more time and a lot more money. So, you know, take classes, uh you you get the formal certificate programs, you know, Lynda dot com type programs. Uh you know, like our on the articulate side we've got all sorts of uh tutorials and things. So if you were uh, motivated. There's a lot of informal learning that you can go through with the articles and the tutorials and things. So, um, but the the main thing is that whatever you're doing to kind of continue your learning process, then use your portfolio to document that. So then it's like, what do I do to do that? So I think it's you know reflecting, writing about what you did, build little modules, you know, practice uh, doing things. In that PDF you'll get, uh, there's some links to portfolios, and uh, you can look at some of the different ways people uh, approach that. Some people uh, write articles. Some people, you know, play around with ideas. Melissa Milloway, some of you may know her. Uh, I like linking to her LinkedIn site. What she'll do is, and she just recently did this uh, um, probably just a few weeks ago, uh, she'll play around with something like, for example, I think she was playing around with uh, JavaScript and variables and storyline, and then she just did a bunch of articles about what she was learning in the process. And they're not um, – it's Melissa Milloway, and you'll see her uh, – somebody was asking about her name, so Melissa Milloway. But you'll see in that PDF that you get, you'll get the uh, link to uh, some of these different portfolios. But she's a really good example and somebody I've mentioned quite a bit because – uh, she does a great job documenting what she's learning. And so, so she doesn't position herself as like, I'm the expert at JavaScript, and so let me show you everything about JavaScript. But it's more like, hey, I wanted to learn how to do something. I know enough about JavaScript to do this. So I talked to this person, and then here's something I came up with. And then she does a really great job sharing what she's learning. And uh, so uh, whether you make that public or not, that's a great approach to take. Uh, in terms of your portfolio, if, you, if you're managing it for your personal development, is this, it's a site or location that you have to write things or show things that you're doing. And again, they don't have to be public, um, but it's you know it's just a way, it's a place that you've got uh, to document your learning. And, and so I think what it does is, uh, if you create the portfolio, what is just the process of creating a portfolio, managing that? There's a lot of uh, technology that you have to consider in doing that, especially as you get become a little bit more sophisticated with managing your own sites. Uh, and then uh, it kind of puts you on a schedule to do things, right? And, and, and you kind of have this, it's like buying a notebook and you've got pages in there, so you've got room now to put stuff on the pages. So it can, you can kind of create a, a schedule to start putting things on pages. So it's a great way uh, to collect your experience. Um, the other thing that's neat is that a lot of the learning that you can do informally now, uh, you can get these open badges. Uh, so I know a lot of people on LinkedIn especially, you'll see that in some of their qualifications. And I think if when you get the PDF and you look at Melissa Milloway's LinkedIn profile, I think she's got some examples of that. So when you take uh, different learning or you do have different learning experiences, uh, online and different sites. Uh, some of them will give you an open badge and then you can put that as a credential uh, in your LinkedIn as kind of a, as an informal learning or formal uh, learning experience. So uh, the main thing though is it's a, it, the portfolio is your way to document uh, what you're learning and, and doing for a personal. At this point, it's not about uh, publishing and showing all that stuff. Uh, and I think the key thing here is really to focus on yourself. You know, what do you want to learn? Set some goals and and start doing that. And I, I would say start simple. You know, like I was saying, read a book and then write a summary of what you read. You know, maybe break it into chapters and then, you know, what did you learn? How can you apply it? Uh, read blog posts, reflect on that. You know, engage the author of the blog post. Say, hey, I, I, you know, 
this is what I read, you know, this is what I got out of it, what do you think? And, you know, then you can kind of document that. I think showing examples of your work and, you know, here's uh, here's something I started with and then I read this and I tried some new ideas and then kind of here's the iteration of this process. So here's my beginning point and as I was playing around with ideas, here are the things I came up with. And, you know, there's always 20 ways to do things. So, you know, Playing around with the 20 ways is a great way uh, to document that and, and, and show that, you know, in, in, in your portfolio. And again, not necessarily uh, showing it uh, to make all that public, but really just a way to kind of catalog it and keep it documented. Yeah, the PDF, I saw somebody's asked about the PDF. That will be available to you in the email uh, that you get after the session. Um, and then I would say the main thing is really don't worry about sharing it. Uh, with other people. So it's really just a, a way for you to create and document what you're doing. It's your personal uh, learning journal. And then uh, the main thing is, you know, start simple. Come up with a simple schedule. I know a lot of people start and they think, well, I'm going to post, you know, three times a week or I'm going to do something three times a week. And I think that just becomes overwhelming because what typically happens is the first week they do three times, the second week one time, and then there's no third week. Uh, so I think if it's just I'm going to do something once a month, uh, it's a great way uh, to do that and, and and then just come up with what you want to do once a month. So keep it simple and something that you can manage because, you know, time is always one of those uh, key elements in there. And then um, I think the other thing in terms of uh, your development is, you know, what type of expertise do you want to develop? You know, what are the most desired skills in your industry? and then um, find a way to kind of focus on those things. And that's a great way to kind of start padding out your portfolio. So, for example, in the e-learning industry, um, you know, general e-learning knowledge, instructional design, you know, knowing how to manage projects, uh, some visual design, those are good things. Um, uh, the skills you have with software, you know, Storyline is one of the dominant uh, e-learning authoring tools, Captivate. So there are different tools out there, but learning to, you know, to show what you can do with those tools. Uh, we do it on Articulate, and you don't have to be an Articulate user, but if you go to the Articulate community, you know, David Anderson always posts a weekly challenge, and the idea of the weekly challenge is to kind of get you to explore different ideas. I think the challenge a lot of people have is that uh, you you may do 100 courses at work, but you're kind of doing the same course 100 times versus doing 100 different courses. So you don't necessarily always get a stretch your skill. So the weekly challenge is a great way um, to do those things. And then, um, you know, when I was working, uh, when I was looking for work years ago, what I started to do is I was actually a video producer and I wanted to get into uh, training. And um, I was working for a healthcare group, so there wasn't any opportunities for me to do training there. So what I wanted to do is get into training. So what I did is I looked up all these different jobs that organizations were, you know, had posted for training, instructional design, anything I could find around that. And then I created two columns in a, in a document. So one column I listed everything in the job description, and then the other side of the column I would kind of I kind of itemized the list. And so if somebody said we need somebody with adult learning, uh, understanding of adult learning. I wrote like a bullet point, like what's my experience with that? And so I kind of created these almost like line item explanations of my skills uh, aligned to uh, these job postings. And then uh, where I didn't have skills or experience, that's what I would focus on. So I would say if you did something similar, it's like if I'm in the e-learning industry and I want to get hired or I want to um, grow in my expertise in an area, look at what companies are looking for, then, you know, kind of create an inventory of that, an inventory of your skills and see where you have some deficiencies and figure out how to get the skills uh, to to uh, grow your expertise. And that then gets you prepared for potential opportunities uh, down the road. And then I think the one last thing on the personal side is, you know, just find a way to collect your work. You know, find a way to uh, document what you've done. You know, just so that you have it. Again, it's more for you at this point, but, 
You know, if you're doing 100 projects, you know, have a place where you, those 100 projects are listed. You don't necessarily need to always show every project, but I think I would do a simple write-up of, you know, here's what the objective was, uh, here's what you did in the process, and here's the outcome. And if you can't show the project, you know, show a screenshot. If you can show the project, don't show everything. Nobody wants to see 300 bullet point slides, but if you have a really cool interaction, you know, show the interaction, uh, that's going to be more interesting than 300 slides. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to click through that. Um, so, but if you can't do that, do a screenshot, but, you know, kind of document, you know, what the objective of the project was, what you did, and, you know, what was, what was the outcome. That'll also, you know, having that documented so you've got that handy, so if you need to apply for a job sometime or you want to show something, you've already got all that stuff put together, and it's easy then to, to curate that into a smaller document or something uh, to, to give to somebody. Uh, and then, you know, you going back to what happens if you lose your work, right? Now you've got all these things documented if you don't have access to your prior work or you don't have access to uh, the software to rebuild those things. I would say, again, when you show examples, you know, keep them small. Uh, as much as people talk about instructional design, you know, the examples that are visually attractive where they have a really good aesthetic to them that, are, that look nice, those tend to get more. Uh, interest than the ones that might be more instructionally sound, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and then if you're trying to figure out how to do those things, again, I would point you to those weekly challenges. That's a great way to kind of kickstart that if you, if you want to have little mini modules uh, that you can show. Uh, but the main thing at this point is, you know, the portfolio at this level is, you know, how do you, um, how do you manage it for your personal development and use that as a way to document what you're doing and what you're learning and kind of uh, collect those experiences so that you have those in, in a single place. Because, you know, we all have those on disks and backups and stuff like that and uh, maybe in, in different documents. But, you know, having a single place to, to manage that is a great starting point. So I'll go ahead and answer some questions and before we go into the professional uh, side of things. So if anybody has any questions, I know we were kind of curating some of those. Perfect. And Tom, I'll give you a few minutes to go through your chat panel. Um, I went ahead and shared the eLearning Challenges website with, with everyone. All right, uh, cool. So if they're interested in checking that out, they can do so. But I'll give you yeah. a few minutes to go through. Yeah, I saw questions. some people were asking about examples of portfolios and um, the PDF. That will be given to you when you, um, when you get the recording in the follow-up email. And in that, I put a bunch of different examples. We just don't have enough time in the hour to kind of go through all these examples. But I did put together a few different types of examples of portfolios so you can kind of see different approaches that people take. I like, you know, Melissa's is a good one because it's hers. She doesn't say this is my portfolio. It's really just the way she's documenting or learning and then leveraging uh, LinkedIn to do that. And then you have some other people that, you know, show examples and some people do free giveaways. So there's all sorts of ways that they manage that, um, you know, and then again, these aren't, at this point, it's probably not more, this is probably more for their professional uh, exposure than it is their personal, but it still gives you some ideas about how people are approaching uh, their different portfolios. So you'll get all of that after uh, the session, and you can look at some of those portfolios uh, that, that, are, that are out there available to look at. Let's see here. Um, convincing students that uh, portfolios are valuable. I, I would go back to, you know, what I was saying earlier. Um, you know, there's a few times we've, at Articulate, we've had job postings and we get, you know, hundreds. I remember one time we got a few thousand, which wasn't manageable for me. But we got, you know, quite a few people who applied for the jobs. And one of the requirements was, hey, I want to see what you're able to do. You know, send me a portfolio. And I would say like 80% of those people didn't have a portfolio. So I said, well, you can go ahead and put one together. But, you know, I'm still going through the process of interviewing and all that. So a lot of those people who probably would have been qualified for the job and may have been good candidates, you know, I had so many candidates, I didn't need to wait on them. And so they missed the opportunity. So I think being prepared, you know, there's always the old saying that luck is um, the, is when opportunity and preparation 
uh, meet, right? So you need to be prepared, and the portfolio allows to do that. And when the opportunities are there, um, you're able to take advantage of. A lot of times, you can't even, you don't even see the opportunity because you're not prepared. So I think a portfolio is just a way to be prepared uh, for those opportunities. You know, otherwise, there's somebody ahead of you that does have a portfolio, and they're going to get in the line first. And, and odds are, they get hired if they're qualified. They're, they get hired before you even can get a portfolio finished. Um, let's see here. Uh, we'll, I'll follow up on this other question here about the instructor-led training. That's a, that's a good question. All right, let me go. Um, yeah, I think there's a, here's a good point someone made. Um, while it's very important to have visually pleasing items in the portfolio, it's also very important to be able to explain why you made the choices you did. I would say yes, that's true. Um, but again, from my experience, you could take 10 people and they could, nine of them could have some really strong instructional design experience and have some really neat uh, modules or whatever they want to show, but maybe they're not as visually strong. The person who has the most visual uh, portfolio is going to tend to get the eyes first. So I think it's just understanding that. I think. You know, if if you're in the process of applying for a job and you have a portfolio, um, the portfolio is like a resume, right? It gets your foot in the door, uh, but you do need to be able then to um, be more than a person who can say, "I can I can build a visually pleasing course." I think that's true. So, I would say when you create a portfolio, you want to keep in mind the the visual aesthetic is super important because if if that's not there, people are going to skip over what you have. Uh, but when you get your foot in the door and you get the opportunity, uh, it's important to be able to, to explain to people, you know, your understanding of uh, what you did in the course design. That's why I, I like the idea of documenting, you know, here was the objective, here's what I did and why, and then here was the outcome. And I think that's a great way to kind of structure uh, what you do in your portfolio. All right, so let's go ahead and transition to the professional uh, side of it. And, uh, let's see here. Professional reasons to maintain a portfolio. I think, you know, probably one of the big ones here is, let me make my screen bigger so I can see, um, is you want to build your brand, right? You want to build your brand. I One of the things I tell my kids, having been laid off uh, in the past, is, you know, you work for an organization, it's important, you know, you want to do a good job and, and everything while you're working for an organization, but you really should see yourself not as an employee, but see yourself as a small business that that organization hired to meet specific needs. Um, and then the question is, you know, how do you uh, market your small business? So how do you market your skills? So when you're working within your organization, you know, how do you market that you're able to do these things and that these are things that you, you've done and you're doing, and then um, kind of build your brand. Like how would a small organization build its per, its brand, right? So when you think about your portfolio, now you're talking about more of a public exposure. So part of what you're doing with the portfolio is building the brand. You know, how do people view you and what do you want people to think about you, right? So that's, that's a key part of it. And that's where then you start talking about the structure and the aesthetic and those things because those things all uh, relate to how people see you, especially that first impression. And and again, the kind of the nice thing about the the internet world is um, you don't people don't need to see what's under the hood. They don't need to know everything about what's under the hood. They'll make assumptions about what's on the hood, right? So in this in a sense, you can control and build your brand, and you could. Uh, position yourself to be um, more expert than you might be, right? And there's, I mean, there's good and bad to that, but um, you can control those things that you might not have been able to do years ago. So, you know, your life is digital, right? And so I think your portfolio is the way for you to be in charge of what you show and how you're presented. And I say don't defer uh, to others. Don't allow others to determine how you're presented, you determine that yourself. And so I, I think you know when you're in an organization, 
you know, you're building your brand in a sense of you want to be recognized as the good worker and, you know, creative and, and, and able to meet a, the organization's goals. Um, but then you want you want to take that outside the organization as well. So your portfolio is a way to kind of build your own brand. And a, and a good example of that, and one of the portfolios I think that you'll see is Tim Slade. Um, you know, what he's done over the last few years in terms of becoming, you know, he was an e-learning developer and he's done a great job positioning himself as more of an expert in in e-learning over the years. So if you go to his site, you can see that. And you look at, you know, you don't have the benefit of necessarily looking at where he started, but you look at what he's done today, and he's done a great job of building his personal brand. Um, so that's an important part of your portfolio. I think the other part, you know, is the key part is that you're able to document and show what you do, right? It's a way to show your work. Again, you don't need to show every single thing. Um, I did a blog post recently um, where I talked about, you know, what should you uh, focus on if you're going to build your skills? And I would say uh, those are the things that are important. So, um, you know, when you look at the e-learning world, what are some common things? So software training, you know, you don't need to show 100 software training, but show something where you've done some software training, screencasting videos, uh, show some diversity in, in how you've used interactivity in your courses. They don't need to be big, expansive uh, courses, but they could be single slide modules. That's, again, going back to those, those weekly challenges. So a lot of those challenges, when you look at some of those, you know, some people do real quick challenges and they're just kind of wireframing. But some people really put some work in there, and they look nice, and they're really nice single-slide interactions, and those types of things are perfect uh, for your portfolio. So show your work, um, but show like a broad range of things and, and keep it simple and quick and, and diverse in terms of the types of stuff you show. And again, nobody needs to see a 30, 40, 100-slide course, um, especially when most of the content's relatively the same, I would say pull out those elements that are unique, and that's what you want to show. And then make it easy for people to get in. One of the things that's frustrating to me is I look at portfolios, and I see quite a few of them because people are always sending me examples of stuff, is when they lock the navigation. So if you know that um, that you're sharing something for a person to look at what you're doing, make it easy for them to jump around. Um, and I've seen that a lot of times people will build little game demos. And, you know, I want to see how they approach things, but I don't have time to go through the entire game. So you should create some shortcuts or a way for a person to jump into different parts of the module rather than forcing them to go uh, through that. Because I can tell you about 15 seconds in, most people are probably going to drop out. So then you, you kind of lose the value of everything that you did. And so, um, you know, show your work, figure out what work you want to show, and then um, post that. And I think, let me see if I can find, because I, I don't know if this article is in that PDF. Uh, this was one I just did. I'll pull up the link real quick, and I'll post it in the chat. This was one I... Um, Let's see here. I think this was it. Yeah, so this article are five ways to kickstart your e-learning career. Let me post that in the chat. Um, put that link in there. So in that, I listed a few different types of um, courses. And so those are the types of things I would put in a portfolio. So I think you know, that's really important that when you're showing your work, you're, you're kind of showing a breadth and diversity in terms of what you're able to do. And um, and let people assume your experience level, right? They'll ask you, you know, somewhere in the interview process, but let them assume. But the nice thing is you can position yourself as an expert. Um, I always tell people uh, you only need to be five minutes ahead of the person asking for help. So, you know, I always call that the five-minute expert. So if somebody has a question and you're able to answer the question, to that person you're an expert. So if somebody is looking at your portfolio and they see all this stuff, even if you only did one of each, you know, you're going to seem like an expert to that person. So I think that's a, a great example of how you can control your brand and control how people perceive you. Um, another thing that's really valuable in portfolios is sharing your work um, and giving things away. Like if you build something, you know, assuming it's not proprietary, but if you build something, you know, clean out the content and give away the interaction. 
Uh, it's a, people love that. You know, we tend to hoard things. Um, but you stand out, right? And you stand out as somebody who's um, able to help, and you stand out as somebody who's, you know, willing to share, and you're kind of you're, you're building goodwill. It's funny because a lot of people are afraid to do that. Um, they think somebody's going to copy or steal their work. Well, guess what? People are going to copy and steal your work anyway if it's good. So, um, but if you're out there giving things away, uh, you're really going to build your expertise. So you'll see that in a lot of those portfolio links that are in that PDF. Uh, a lot of the people there, whatever they work on or if they're playing around with ideas, uh, they clean them up and then they make those available for free. Or even in those weekly challenges, a lot of times people ask for the source file so they can see them. And you give them away and you're building the goodwill and you're building your expertise. You know, the, the people assume that if you're giving it away and you've done something that you've got a, a higher level of expertise than you may have, but you're establishing that expertise because uh, you're sharing your work and, and you're building the relationships. And I will give one more plug on those weekly challenges. A lot of people get work from those challenges because those examples, uh, those, those modules, for example, they get sent out to all of the uh, in emails and different things that we do and the, you know, because we like to show what people are doing and people like to see what people are doing. So when you do those things, um, that work gets pushed out and it gets seen by hundreds of thousands of people. So it's a great way, if, if you're in the mix of that and you're sharing your work, you kind of stand out. It's a great way to kind of leverage uh, that opportunity so you can pad your portfolio uh, with that. And then, um, the other thing is, you know, think about, you know, how you want to organize uh, your e-learning portfolio. Um, I would say a few things. You want to, you know, connect with people. So figure out how you can connect with people in the process, right? So you have all the different social media. Um, the um, a lot of people uh, push a bunch of stuff out in their portfolio, and they're really just concerned about clicks and likes and all of that. I don't think that's necessarily a good way to do it. I think it's really thinking about, you know, what do you add that's valuable? And then, you know, putting that in your portfolio, making that there, um, being a curator of resources, um, you know, thinking through, you know, the difference between articles and the different types of content that you have. Um, and then um, making it, all that stuff available and kind of becoming a, um, a voice in the industry, and that's where I think the networking and those things are important. But you know, your portfolio is kind of your hub. So as people come to know you, you got to think about you know how do you organize what you've got there. So I think you know if you have you know separate articles from examples from you know downloads and that type of stuff, um, that's an important part. And then also you know the um, uh, being the curator. So that's a great way to establish your expertise. So you know, scanning the internet. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I've got, I've got a cold. Um, but scanning the internet, and then looking at things that are interesting, and then bringing them to your site and writing or documenting them in some way, and saying this is why this is these are important things, and this is why this is important. You know, you be, you get seen as an expert because you're doing that curation, and it's a great way to then connect as you're kind of building your brand outward. You know, and then I think this is something a lot of people struggle with is, you know, the, the, that source of inspiration. A lot of people, I was saying earlier, copy things. Hold on, I need to mute for a second. My, uh, it muted. I've got a bad cold, so I was trying not to cough. Um, but I couldn't find my mute button. So I apologize for that. Um, but a lot of people, you know, people are going to steal. If you do good work and you're showing it, people are going to steal it anyway or copy it, you know, or use it for inspiration. Um, and odds are that a lot of the work that you do is kind of inspired by others. A lot of people make this mistake of being inspired by others and then kind of holding on, to, you know, and then building their own thing and then holding on to that as, as if it's theirs. And I think what happens is 
it's kind of a closed minded approach because what happens is when people recognize that you were inspired by others, then it kind of seems like may, maybe this person's a fraud, right? But if you kind of openly share, it's like, hey, I saw so and so did this and I kind of like this, and so here's my take on that. That's a great way to be connected, to be seen as an expert, and to kind of not be accused of um, stealing uh, people's work. So I think the thing is the pie is really big, so don't worry about you know sharing that or showing that you've uh, shared uh, some of that. So um, what's in your portfolio? We already kind of talked about that, right? So making sure you get um, a lot of uh, the kind of the diversity in there, that's really important. And then um, the other part is, you know, being part of the community to build your network. So, you know, figure out, you know, what you want to do. If you're using a tool, you know, be part of that tools community. If you're, you know, in a certain type of industry, be part of that industry's community. It's really important. And um, you can leverage your portfolio to build your expertise there. And then, um, the, the key thing again is, you know, your portfolio at a professional level is a way to document who you are and what you're able uh, to do and build that brand, right? So build an understanding of you as an expert. And, you know, we see that all the time. We see people who you know, are freelancers or, you know, they're, they're people in the past you would never have known, but because of the way we're able to connect today, they're able to go into a weekly challenge or go into a community somewhere and share their thoughts and share what they do and using that portfolio to do that. And that becomes kind of their personal hub. And now they're seen as experts where years ago they might have just been sitting in an office somewhere with that same level of expertise but have no way to share that or demonstrate that to the rest of the world. And today you can do that and then largely through, uh, through how you network, you know, with the digital technologies and the social media and all that, but also with how you document all that stuff in your portfolio. So any questions about that part of it? And then we'll talk about it, the, the other parts relatively simple, but talk about a few different uh, approaches in terms of the technology as we finish up. Let me see here. Uh, let's see. Go scan through some of these questions here. Uh, if you only have two or so projects, that's a good question. If you only have a few projects, that's where, you know, um, I used to, like when I made my little list, I used to go out there and um, I'd like, let's say, go to the Red Cross site and find something on CPR and I would do a project on CPR. Or you can go. Like there's all sorts of consumer education, you know, like identity fraud and things like that that are on these government sites. So you have a lot of content that's out there. So I would just take some content and build something or the weekly challenges, you know, that type of thing is, you know, find a topic and then build little modules around that. Um, let's see here. Best practice for number of items. I think it's the diversity, right? So. Um, like that link I was pointing to, you know, quizzes, scenarios, interactions, you know, software training, that type of stuff. That's common. That's what organizations look for. So if you're able to, you know, demonstrate your understanding or some examples around that's important. Uh, you don't need to have a lot. Nobody wants to spend, you know, forever looking at your portfolio, but you want to have enough that kind of shows what you're able to do. And, you know, you have an archive, like a catalog, right, if you're continuing to document things. And I would say, find a way to always float your best stuff up front because if you do keep adding to that, eventually your best stuff's going to get buried. So it's important to kind of figure out how you want to bring the, the good stuff up uh, forward. Yeah, if you're not, how do you make your portfolio visually appealing if you're not really a great graphic designer? Uh, we'll talk about that with the technologies. You have some sites that make it a little bit easier, like some portfolio sites and, you know, sites like Wix uh, that kind of help manage some of that. Uh, so we'll look at that here in a second. What do you think about using free software to build your portfolio? For example, Jing for screen capturing, Powtoon for short videos. Those are all fine. Um, I would say, you know, Jing for screen capturing is fine because screen capturing and screen capturing, so it's really about understanding how to do the screen capturing. Something like Powtoons or GoAnimate and those things, those are great, but 
one is they can be really bad. I've seen a lot of really bad Powtoons and <laughs> GoAnimate modules. So it's important if you're going to use something like that to do a good job, right, and make them short and, and, and concise and, and, uh, and really pointed. Um, but the other thing is the value of what makes those interesting is in the Powtoons or in the GoAnimate. So it's, it's really important that, you know, you don't over lean on, on those types of tools uh, and, and diminish kind of what you're able to do versus, hey, here's a tool I use that allowed me to do some visually interesting things, but, you know, I didn't really do that much then outside of the tool. So I think, you know, that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're doing that. Um, tips for career shifters. I think it's just jumping in, you know, figuring out, make a list of some things you want to do, kind of like I was talking about, you know, look at what jobs are being posted and then, um, and then take it from there. Uh, look at what skills you need. So let's, I'll wrap up real quick. I've got a couple of minutes here. The things about the technology, a uh, couple of things, I think kind of key points, um, portfolio sites. There are a lot of uh, different ways to present your portfolio. A lot of people use sites like Wix and, and some of those that kind of can pre-build them. Uh, you can make them look nice or some nice, um, uh, uh, structure to them and they visually look nice. The challenge is it's hard to put courses on there. So if you're, you're going to use a site like Wix, you can't upload your course. So I think it's important to also then get an Amazon or some other type of service, Amazon, Google Cloud. And I've got some links in that PDF that show how to do that. And then you can upload your courses in there and then add those links. Uh, if you use a site like Wix or Squarespace. Um, I prefer like having a personal domain, so buying a domain and using uh, your name and having a, a custom email versus, you know, like, you know, uh, John Smith at Gmail or John Smith at Yahoo. I think having John Smith at like smithelearning.com is, is, is seems a little bit more professional. So having uh, a personal domain and then having a WordPress site or your own website is an easier way to go. Of course, you've got to learn how to do that. So a Wix is easy. Those types of sites are nice, but then you have to figure out how you want to manage and upload your courses. And you have that with those. Uh, in that link, I show how to um, use Amazon S3. And that, all that stuff is super cheap and sometimes even free. Amazon S3 and Google Cloud and those things you can use uh, to upload your courses. The one thing I think about when you're using something like LinkedIn or Facebook is they own the site, you don't own it. So, you know, what you do today may not be what you can do uh, six months from now or a year from now. So that's always something to keep in, in mind. It's a great way to network and connect, but, you know, something to really think about in terms of managing uh, your content. And then um, the I already kind of mentioned the personal domain. I think, you know, it costs money. It takes, you got to learn a little bit more. But it's not that expensive, and you kind of have better control then, so you can upload your courses. But you do have to learn, you know, how to do some of that. So, you know, there is a time investment there. But I kind of think that's going to make you seem more professional. But it's really just a matter of, you know, what what's going to work best for you. And then uh, WordPress, you know, you get uh, WordPress with your own site. You get control over uploading your courses, which is the key thing, because a lot of those sites, when you look at them, you can't you can't upload your courses, so you're going to have to find a way to do that and create links. And so I think having your own site, you know, that's kind of the key thing is, you know, I can control and upload that media that I want to upload, videos or whatever that is. Um, and then, you know, I think that the other thing is, you know, show examples of your work, but keep everything simple and come up with a simple schedule uh, that's easy for you uh, to manage. And then um, I, I like the once a month and just, you know, kind of keeping a rotation and and removing as much friction as you can. So if you give things away, if you, if you're, um, whatever you do, make it as simple as possible for people to see and find uh, what you have in your portfolio. And then I've got that PDF that's got those example portfolios. So you can uh, uh, look at those and, and you have my email address. I'll put, put it up here in a second. Um, can't remember where I have it. I'll, I'll show it. Not, I think it's on one of the slides. And then, um, or you can just email Tom at articulate.com. Um, but this, you know, it's a great saying, right? Luck is when preparation and opportunity meet. So um, 
the key here is the opportunities are out there. Um, your role is being prepared and having that professional portfolio or having a portfolio, maintaining, managing your own personal learning, and then having a way to document what you know and, and share that with others is a, is a key part of that. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing all the information um, during the webinar today. If any of you have any questions, I know we, we ran out of time, but his presentation was so full of resources and um, other experiences that he shared. If you have any questions, feel free to send it to us via email. Um, Tom had provided his email address. If you also wanted to send any questions or comments to my email, I have it listed here on this slide, um, and I will be happy to forward it on to Tom as well. And hopefully all of you gained some insight into how to build an e-learning portfolio. Um, if you saw any winter classes that piqued your interest, uh, please remember to register early because our courses do fill up quickly. And hopefully you will consider adding our certificate program to your professional portfolio. Um, this slide, let me go here. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors. So feel free to contact us with any questions. And just another reminder, we will be sending out the webinar recording link later on today, as well as the PDF that Tom had mentioned that has several resources. We will send that out with the recording link as well later on today, so you will all be getting receiving that in your email. Um, thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Tom, for taking time out of your day to present for us here today. Thank you. Thank you all.